Uh, guys, I was really excited to have Mike come on here and chat and, and to talk about the landscape of online coaching, remote coaching, and where it's at, because he's been doing it from the very beginning, and not just remote coaching, because that was the experience that was available for athletes that he had to work with, but building info products, single cell purchase, building funnels, building out, you know, developing a content strategy. Uh, yep. How many blog posts have you written now? Oh my gosh, dude, if you go to my website, we're talking in the thousands of uh, pieces of content, so. For how many years? Oh, dude, I started creating content in like, oh, one, like way before I ever should have, right? If we're being real, way before I ever should have. But yeah, I've been creating content almost as long as I've been coaching. Right, right. So I want to bring that up because guys, the game is at the same point, like, this is where the same game, the game is exactly at the same spot right now. Like yep. for you to roll into from, if you were an in-person coach and Mike owns a facility, if you're an in-person coach, happen to force into online or you're trying to be hundred percent online, you have to build a strategic strategy around how you're going to gain clients and what kind of experience you're going to give them, not only in, in your buying process, but in terms of once they start paying you, what is the experience that you're giving them and how does that match up to the dollar value that you're selling at? So it can provide, you know, Mike yep. owns a physical facility. He's got a family. He's got kids. Like, there's shit on the line, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's not like he just gets to, like, be me and, like, oh, I, don't, I live by myself, right? Like, <laughs> there's things that he has to, you know, he, I get eight extra hours a day, right? So right. you're having to figure out how to do all this shit with two little kids running yep. around the house, yep. right? So that's a lot of people's scenarios. Can you yep. tell us just a little bit about, you know, your journey into fitness, what like you, the way you kind of operate, the way your system kind of works and the content <laughs> you do and, and maybe some tips and tricks along the way? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I won't give you like the whole, whole backstory, but I was somebody like both my parents at, at heart were teachers, right? My dad really was a teacher at Ball State. and My mom taught horseback riding. Um, so I knew early on that I was into coaching, which is just another form of teaching. Um, did the whole grad school thing, um, did three years doing rehab, spent another three years doing in-home one-on-one. I've owned a gym for 12 years now. So like I've done like the tour de force of everything in the fitness industry. And just along the way, I felt, I don't know why, I, I think the best word is I felt compelled to share what I'd learned. Um, so like as early as 2001, I was writing for this print again now we're talking about age here a print magazine called monster muscle that was geared towards power lifters uh, i wrote for them for like two years some other smaller sites and in 2003 i actually went with uh, my wife fiance at the time now wife uh to a nutrition conference and i'm looking at the conference i'm like man i don't know any of these people oh wait this guy sounds familiar john B bacardi Bar Barardi? John oh yeah john Barardi. And so he was writing for T Nation, um, go early because I'm like, well, at least this guy's a bro. You know, I want to hang out with a bro. So we went early. He was setting up super gracious. Like he talked to us for like 20 minutes that day. Um, and he just said, oh, you know, if you're a writer, you should submit something to TC, who was the editor at T Nation at that point in time. I was like, okay. And like six weeks later, I had my first article up at T Nation. Again, probably before I should have. But I mean, for me, that, that started it all. It's like mm -hmm. writing articles for six, seven, eight years turned into writing blogs. Um, blogs turned into podcasts and video now. Um, the game is the same in the sense that you have to constantly deliver content. You have to find a way to show up that's unique and authentic and real to you. Um, but yeah, it's like the game is the same. The mediums have changed a little bit. The way the distribution changes a little bit. Um, and it's more sophisticated for sure. Um, yeah. but yeah, it's the same now as it was 20 years ago yep. in a lot of respects. How did you know what to talk about back then? Right? Like I, I literally, Mike, I looked at this, uh, I was in this, I'm in a million Facebook groups as you know, and, and yep. I'm in there and, and it's, I've got 10 clients. I lost all 10 clients. I don't know. I don't have any money to put ads out. I don't even know how to make an ad and <laughs> I don't like Facebook and Instagram has never worked for me. Yep. Like, how do I market myself? And, and that's content, right? How do yeah. you know what to write about as a young kid? Um, so the thing that always worked for me was, first off, getting over the fact that if you're trying to do something new, stop. Stop. Like, there's nothing new about a squat. Yet how many squatting articles do we get every day of the week, right? Or deadlifts or bench press. Name an exercise that's been written about. 
What you have to do is one of two things. Either number one, you have to take 100% your angle on it. Like there is some way that you can write about this article. You have a unique experience. So you have to relay that. And if you can relay that in your unique, authentic way, it's going to resonate with a certain amount of people, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. The other thing that always worked for me was if you have people that you're working with or people that you've worked with in the past, mm -hmm. the questions that they ask are literally a trove of content. <laughs> so, hey, why do you tell me to push my knees out when I squat? Or why do you care so much about these abs right here? Like, you, if you coach people on a regular basis and you carried around a notebook and just wrote down the questions that you asked, you would have a stream of content that you could use for years. So this is the way I try and express this to people. Like, don't try and be unique in the sense that squats are squats, benches are benches. Like, the, art, the, the exercises are by and large going to be the same. But you have to bring your own unique flair, your own authentic, authentic story and experience to it. And if you do that, chances are you're going to be successful. Mm, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, to using your real time, the questions you're getting in a real time feedback, like, oh, yeah, yes. that is what other people are wondering. Literally, right? they're, they're asking you questions, you just have to take it and answer it in, in a, a written, verbal or video format. That's all it yeah. takes. Yeah. And how did you choose? I mean, right, obviously, video was really extensive back then. But yeah. like, were you a writer? Did you were you used to putting yourself out there with oh words? Like, how did you go no. through this process? No, I was like the world's worst writer. Like I joke around um, and I hope Mr. Bullock, my eighth grade English teacher never sees this. But like, uh, like we would, we had these things that we would have to go and like fill out and then you go and get like the next card. But like the next card had the answers to the previous card. So I was like cheating my way through eighth grade English. Um, no, I don't know how I got started. For me, I think what writing allowed me to do was I've got like, just like a lot of energy um, a lot of like thoughts going on. So what it did was it forced me to sit down and kind of channel my thoughts in one direction. Mm. And every coach knows there's a big difference between knowing and understanding something yourself and being able to communicate that clearly to somebody else. Mm. So that was really important for me. I could sit down and I could explain very clearly in my own terms what it means to squat well what it means to deadlift well, because that's what all my early stuff was about was lifting. Yeah. And so it just gave me this format to like get all my thoughts, streamline it, <clears throat> whittle it down to like a really simple language that everybody could understand. So look, I was not a writer to begin with by any stretch of the imagination, but it's something that for me forced me to sit still long enough to get all my thoughts in order and then put it into something that, you know, genuinely a lot of people could understand. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of, I think a lot of times too, people put out a piece of content and they expect it to go viral tomorrow. And, <laughs> yes. uh, and like, that's definitely not the case. Like you've definitely had right. some pieces do really, really well. Sure. Uh, and you might have one that you're like, this is going to be the best thing I ever wrote. Right. And it's Crickets. like, it bombs on its face and Crickets. you're like, damn yeah. it. Right? right. But like, how, how do you know how long to go with a strategy? Maybe you're a certain writing style or a certain formatting style or a yep. voice that you're playing with. How do you choose how long to go with a certain strategy before you say, nope, too long to go, or I need to, I need to change it up. Yeah. You know, I, I'm going to kind of, I don't want to say dodge that, but I'm going to kind of sidestep it a little bit and just, just say, I think, most people give up way too soon. Yep. So when I had a lot of interns, and this is like early to late 2000, so like 8, 9, 10, 2011, 12, when still like blogs were a big thing. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of interns. I had a lot of people come to me and say, oh, man, I'm, I'm ready to get in the, the internet game. I'm ready to go online because like online was still like a new, a new place. Mm -hmm. And I just told them, look, man, I love it. Like we need more great coaches that are online. Here's my advice to you. If you're going to start a blog, be comfortable writing one blog a week, every week for a year. And no, just know that three people are going to read that blog. You, your girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse, whatever, and your mom. And if you're okay with that <laughs> and putting that effort into it, eventually it's going to get traction. Yeah. Right. Like Ben Bruno. Like, I don't know if people remember Ben Bruno starting out, but all Ben Bruno did was aggregate content for like two years. For two years, his entire blog was once a week, here's 40 articles that I loved. And then later in the week, here's like 35 vet videos from other coaches that I love. 
and he built a massive audience. He wasn't even his content at the time, right? And I love Ben, like it's genius. But like that's the dedication that you have to have, right? You've got to commit to, you know, once a week, twice a week, whatever it ends up being, whatever you can do, I'm going to commit to this for a year and see what happens. So like yeah. right now for me, just because I enjoy video, but I'm not like a, a thousand percent in it, I have just said for the, like the next 90 days, I'm going to create a video every day. And so I'm like three or four weeks in now. Um, and it's just like a, a test or a challenge to myself. But I think you just have to like set the standard for yourself and be like, okay, I'm just going to continuously put out content because what you end up finding then, Sam, is you find your own voice, mm -hmm. right? You find like, no, this is my voice. This is how I speak. This is how I talk. And then it's comfortable. It's not something you have to force or like conjure up. It's like, no, this is just my voice this is how I speak. And then it comes naturally to you after a while, if you do it long enough. Yeah. Well, you know, let me ask you this now, this, you know, and, th and this is the part that I think that gets a lot of people. I've got, maybe they do it part time. Maybe they're, they got a, a restaurant job or something else trying to make ends meet. So their hours are stretched. Yeah, sure. Or in like your case, you have two young children and a wife, yeah. uh, which uh, is somewhat constraining on your time. Uh, and, uh, and then businesses and interns and employees, right? right? So like right. you play the game. Yep. How do you get it done? How are you able to stay to a schedule? How do you still make sure you're, you know, attentive to your kids? How do yeah. you stay attentive to your wife? But you, I mean, you're still coming out with content. You're still building new products. Like we're talking about new yeah. things all the time. Like yeah. how do you, how do you do it as with that, all that shit going on? Yeah. So, well, number one, I think you realize that when you have kids, you realize how much time you wasted when you didn't have kids. Right. And that's just being real. Like I felt like I was super productive before I had kids. And then it's like, you have this, this latent superpower that you just pick up because you realize, oh my gosh, I have an hour and a half while this kid's sleeping to get all this stuff done. It's go time and you just crank, right? So I think the best piece of advice that I can give somebody is to be really ruthless about planning and scripting your day. Um, mm. Now granted, this is a lot harder right now, especially if you have kids, there's a lot more things going on and we're shifting everything, mm -hmm. right? So like we're used to a weekly routine and right now my kids don't have that. So they think mm -hmm. it's a seven day weekend. So we're trying to like, let them know, okay, look, we got a five day week. We still have to work. Mom and dad still have to work. You know, we're going to get more time with you. Yep. Um, but I think the, the idea of scripting and planning your day is super important. And one thing that I've learned with that is you have to be really diligent with your stop times. And that's mm -hmm. one thing that I don't think a lot of people do because we all know that tasks expand to the amount of time we give them. Right. So if we give ourselves a year, to finish a project, it'll take a year. But what if you could do that same project in three months? Because mm -hmm. most of the times you can, right? But you have to you have to put that constraint on yourself. So think of that from a macro level to a micro level. Mm -hmm. Now on a day to day basis, hey, this meeting that we normally take an hour for, does, we don't need an hour. Like let's get that done in thirty minutes, and then we can move on to the next thing. But I think just being really diligent in scripting, planning your day, getting clear every day as to what are like my my big things are going to move the needle because a lot of times we get into reactive mode and then it's like emails and calls and messages. And those things are important. Don't get me wrong, but they're probably not going to be the big things that move the needle. Mm -hmm. So trying to get some of those big items crossed off the list early in the day, you know, planning your day. Those are the big things. And if you're doing those chances are you're going to win more days than you lose. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I want to talk about this with Mike because A, he's been doing it for so long to refine the process to get there, but he's also got a lot of the same life constraints that everybody else has. Like yep. it's, it's, it's hard for me to give that advice being a yeah. 33 year old single dude. Right. Like sure. I get that. Like, and I, him and I have talked about this. Like I get, I get eight extra hours a day. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, don't always, I don't always use them well, but yeah. I definitely have eight more hours a day. And I was just bitching with Bornstein about it yesterday, right. <laughs> about the whole thing. I was like, how's it going? He's like, dude. Right. And like, yeah. but you know, it's, I get that. And I honor that, but like, I don't think anybody would look at me and say, oh, Sam doesn't work hard, right? And that's right. very important for me to like, the market recognizes that. Absolutely. So for you, it's really, you know, when we start going through this, this efficiency game of like, how do I plan content? What kind of content? I'm building out this online business. We're, we're talking about strategies, the big picture of what it's going to take to have an online business and yes. how to get remote clients. Yes. Now, we've talked about big picture. I want to talk about the next piece is creating an experience with your remote clients yep. and how do you build that and how do you build it to a price point that honors the time that you can put into it yeah 
Man, this is such a good question. And I think one of the things that's really important is to try and, if you have worked offline, try and emulate as much of that as you can online, right? Because what's the one thing that you can't get online? You can't get that one-to-one -one personal interaction, right? There's just like this cold kind of distant approach to things. So like something that I changed, and I, did, I didn't do this for years. When I first started, everything was literally remote. So I had clients that I would work with for four or five years and I'd never talk to them on the phone. Now it's like the first thing that we do, we're going to jump on a call and we're going to preferably like a zoom or a Skype or something like that. So it's not just a call and I can hear their voice, but I can see their face. I start to form a connection with them just and, and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. They start to see, okay, Mike's committed to me. He understands me. Then even if you get whatever, like let's say you get 20 or 30 online clients down the line, it's not just like, who, who is this guy? You know, who is this girl? I don't even remember them. No, because now you've had this personal interaction. You've had this connection with them. And now they're not just a number. They're a person that you're trying to help. So mm -hmm. I think that's really important. The second thing that I think is really critical when you're building out like the online coaching and, and trying to get that set up is really being proactive in the communication side. And I've done this long enough. I mean, again, I started, I think I took my first online client in 2006. And true story, I still have it. Nice. Like, he's, he's the only one that I've kept <laughs> from 2006. Um, but he's a, a guy that lived in Japan. Yeah. And so awesome dude, trained Mark forever. Um, and Mark, Mark is maybe the exception to the rule because he's trained so long. Um, yeah. And he's a very fit guy. I don't hear from him as frequently as others. But I can tell you, the people that I hear from like every single day that need like their hand held and that sort of thing, probably not going to be the best fit because I'm not like, I'm not just a pure online coach. Yep. If that's all I did, then maybe I would say I need you to check in every day. Or if it was like a fat loss, like accountability type thing, I need a daily check in. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you um, if they're checking in at least once a week, they're on board. The people that check in too often, I feel like need like uh, more of like a hand holding than they need a coach. Mm -hmm. And the people that check in like once a month to just say they need a new program probably aren't getting the most out of the experience. Mm -hmm. So it's on you as their coach to be proactive, to make sure that they're doing what they need to, to make sure that they're feeling like they're being serviced at a high level. Um, and just, again, I think those, even if you do it like once a quarter, you know, where it's uh, a quick 20 to 30 minute Zoom session or something like that, like you would do in a brick and mortar facility, right? Maybe once a quarter, you're going to bring a client in, you're going to sit down, you're going to wrap. Hey, how's the session going for you? Are we on track for your goals? If yes, great. What other goals are we going to hit? If no, okay, what's going wrong? How do we fix that? So trying to take it and make it look and feel more like an offline business Mm -hmm. is going to give you that human and that social factor that's so important with what we do. Yeah. Now, when you set out to build your remote business, you know, you'd already been in the in-person space, you've been writing. Um, did those, like, did your audience, did they all kind of come together? Did you kind of choose the audience you were trying to attract with your writing and that became your online client? Because I know you work with everybody from like the high school soccer yep. uh, player to the professional NBA star. Yeah. And like, you know, your content works with everybody right yep. but like yep. you know you I definitely have a spin to it like how did you choose all that and or how, was it dictated for you um you know a little bit of it was a byproduct of um where i was at training wise i mean i was into powerlifting for like 11 years um so i definitely got guys that trended more towards the strength um side of things mm -hmm. uh, but i also wrote a ton about like corrective exercise and injury prevention and being like an educated meathead so I feel like I got a lot of those people that were like a little bit beat up. Maybe they didn't need surgery or they didn't need like traditional physical therapy, but they needed somebody to like kind of guide their programming for them. Um, you know, and that, that was always something that I enjoyed because I mm -hmm. felt like it merged two things that I was passionate about. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'd had injuries in the past. I didn't want to be injured and beat up when I, you know, got to 50 or 60 years old. I wanted to be strong and healthy. And so that was always the, the allure for me too was like, Hey, that's how I want to train. So these people that want that same kind of uh, in, in goal or they have that same end goal, those are the kind of people I want to work with. So between, you know, being a power lifter, competing in powerlifting, writing for T Nation, like that kind of led me to like this perfect mix of people 
that I wanted to train and coach. So I think it always comes back to kind of be where they are. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of have to put yourself in the middle of whatever world they're in. Mm -hmm. So it worked out really well for me in that sense. Yeah. And I think, you know, cause it's, I, you know, you hear it all the time, right? You guys run an intern program where, you know, you ask like, oh, well, who do you work with or who do you want to work with? Well, I can yep. train everybody. Well, it's like, yeah, I mean, I get that you can train everybody, yep. but like that doesn't make that client necessarily feel special. So right. then it turns into like, well, in, when you're an in-person facility, you can get away with it because geography or just the value proposition or the yes. gym itself. But when you're online, you kind of have to have a little bit of a shtick. Absolutely. And you kind of have to have like, hey, like he might call themselves the educated meathead. Yep. Right, like he's talking about meat heady things, but he's talking about the things that, like, oh yeah, that the meat heady guys are like, oh yeah, I I need to do that thing. Right? Yeah, I'm not doing that thing, and yep. then you become an expert in your field, right? But like For Mike sure. said in the beginning of the conversation, you kind of got to be unapologetic about saying your opinion. Yes, right, because yes. which which means not every comment is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> not every comment is like, God, Mike, you changed my life about looking at the squat. Right, <laughs> right, because <laughs> people it's, are very opinionated. Dude, it's such a good point, and it's it's absolutely important because now when you remove geography as a determining factor, it's like, man, people can go to anybody, mm-hmm. right? If they're going to go online, they can go anywhere, any coach. So I think that's why it's so critical. If you don't have a big audience to start, you better be really niche and really tight with your niche, and your videos need to support that your messaging needs to support that your language needs to support that right like you can't be super wishy-washy because you know we've all heard the saying like when you try and appeal to everybody you appeal to nobody Mm -hmm. like that's even more true online than anywhere else Mm -hmm. so you have to have a strong message a strong voice and it doesn't mean when i say strong it doesn't mean like like you know like angry like football strength Uh coach guy but it's like you need to be direct and you need to have a strong message in the sense that you're clear You know how you feel, you know who you're talking to, because that comes across so strongly. And again, authenticity, right? Especially when we're talking about this kind of game, you have to be authentic in what you do. Mm -hmm. From a coaching and delivering an experience of, you know, achieving X results or whatever adaptation, what's the biggest difference between remote coaching someone and in-person coaching someone? Yeah. So let me tell you about 2006, and then I'll tell you about what what it's like now, right? So in 2006, when I was taking online clients, the assessment process consisted of like them filling out a form and sending me a training program. And then they would take posture pictures for me, right? And not just like double biceps, but like (laughs) side, front, whatever. Um, And that was the evaluation process, right? Because video was not a thing. Mm -mm. You're not sending videos on the internet. Versus now, you know, it's basically the assessment that we have at iFast, except I can't put my hands on you and move your joints around, but I can do everything else. And video is so easily accessible. So I would say, here's the one limiting factor. And even this can be changed. The biggest limiting factor right now is the the idea or the concept of real-time feedback. Mm. All right. So if I'm watching you in the gym squatting, and I see you do something wrong, immediately I can give you a cue and you can change it on your next rep. In most cases, when you are coaching somebody online, they're gonna video a set, they're gonna send it to you, and then you're gonna give them feedback after the fact. All right, so that's the biggest limiting factor. Now, even that can be, can be fixed at this point. So literally before we came on the show, our gym is closed, right? Like most gyms are right now. So two of my clients said, hey, I w- we wanna do a Zoom session with you. So I just coached them for two hours on Zoom and I could give them that immediate feedback. So even that's not an issue anymore. Like nothing, nothing has to be that different other than the fact now of like, I can't touch you, right? Like I can't put my hands in between your shoulder blades and say, when you row, I need you to squeeze back and feel that muscle. Mm -hmm. Like that's really it at this point. Like it's amazing to think how much things have changed and evolved in 14 years. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And, and what, what's coming and how fast it's coming. I mean, look what we're doing right now. Oh, I know. Right? Like know. in 2006, how did you meet other fitness professionals? Uh, I went to conferences or I went to their gym. And like, like now it's like, oh yeah, what are you doing? Oh yeah, you're over there. Okay, cool. We can be done in an hour. And it's just, it's that yeah. easy. Absolutely. Or, oh, Sam's on uh, IG live. I'm going to see what Sam's up to right now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, yeah, the world is so different. But but just think about this, my guy. Like, think about 
Think about what's changed in a month. Yeah. Think about what's changed in a month. We went from a 100% essentially offline brick and mortar business to within a week, we had all of our staff with specific Zoom rooms, right? Our clients were scheduling through, we use MindBody, it's not a plug, but you know, they go on the <laughs> schedule through MindBody and then like they go to the Zoom room and they're meeting with their coach like in a week. Yeah. So just think about the innovation. I'm not saying we're super innovative, but as an industry, think about all the things that we've had to change mm -hmm. and how quickly we've had to pivot in two to three weeks. Yeah. Like imagine if we were constantly forced to like adapt and evolve like that. It's crazy to think about. It's unbelievable. And like, I mean, it's nice to see like you're just not super stressed out. Like, you know, I was like, I wanted to have a quick response to this thing, but like, ah, everybody I want to talk to has got shit to do. Right? right. Like they got gyms, they have businesses to take care of. Like I need to right. let them have time. But it's like, it's so nice knowing that like, oh yeah, Mike and I can chat. Like, you know, it's like, he's gonna, he's okay. Things are okay. Right. Yep. Cause you guys figured it out. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, and for the people who are in facility owners, tell people a little bit about iFast and how you guys do things and what your reaction to this was. Yeah. So again, Bill and I opened iFast in 2008. He's a physical therapist. I'm more classically a strength coach or personal trainer. Um, but the thing that makes us unique is he was like a hardcore bodybuilder and loved to push weights and get strong. And I spent three years in a rehab facility. So we both saw each other's end of the spectrum and we were both just really focused on, okay, how do we continue to take what we're doing and evolve it and grow it and make it better and kind of just overlap as much mm -hmm. as we can. So now we train everything from, as you alluded to, middle and high school age kids, um, division one athletes or, you know, just college age athletes, stay at home moms, retired people, professional sports. We train it all. And again, this is where your idea of you got to kind of have a shtick. So like our shtick, because we could have a 60 year old grandmother in there mm -hmm. training next to a uh, NBA basketball player and they, they're having a conversation, right? And they get along and you think, well, how does that happen? Well, it's because everybody in their respects the fact that people are in there because they want to get better at something else, right? Like our gym isn't the gym that you go to, to, to bench 225 for 10, just to say you bench 225 for 10, right? Like you go there to say, oh yeah, I benched 225 and now it's making me better at this sport. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, our 70 year old um, ladies that come in and they trap bar and they trap bar like 180 pounds. And they don't care so much. It's cool that they trap bar to 180, but they do that because they want to be able to go out in their garden and garden pain free. Yeah. So like that's our so that it's because people that come into our gym want to get stronger or fitter or whatever so that they are more awesome in other areas of their life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit about us. Now, as far as how we reacted to this, <clears throat> well, I think like all of us, we freaked out a little bit <laughs> if we're being honest. Yep. Um, you know, we're in there with all of the cleaners, like the day before we got shut down, wiping things down, and we had contingency plans, and they said, okay, everybody's got to shut down for a week. All right, perfect, so we're going to shut down for a week, and I had this whole game plan of, okay, we can do social distancing, we can limit our numbers to less than 10. Um, if we do our semi-private sessions, no open gyms, no group stuff, all the group stuff's online. So I had this beautiful plan. I'm like, I got this. <laughs> And then Governor Holcomb <laughs> literally comes on in our staff meeting and says, okay, um, we are shutting everything down for two weeks. I'm like, okay. So literally in the staff meeting, we're like, okay, what do we do? And we started, okay, we signed up for four, like a whatever, a four pack of Zoom accounts. I got all of my uh, staff a uh, specific room, uh, shot a video to our staff or to our staff, to our members. And just explain, look, this is where we're at. We're taking a two-week hiatus. You can schedule through MindBody. You can meet with your coach on Zoom. You know, we're going to customize the workouts to you. Is it going to be perfect? No. Do you want to be in the gym? Yes. We get it. We're frustrated too, but, like, let's make this work. We need to do this to keep your body up, to keep you healthy and fit and strong. You want to talk about the number one way to fight something off? Have a strong immune system. You know, manage your stress. Be fit. So that was the message that we touted. We went like a week or two and then they said, okay, you know, now we got to say like six weeks, right? So now we're at May 1. And so we just said, look, at this point in time, 
we're not comfortable. We stopped all of our memberships for the month. And that's, again, everybody's got their own opinion and how they do things. We paused all of our memberships for the month. Um, anybody that wanted to stay on um, and use the Zoom rooms, perfect. We're going to continue. You can continue being billed. We'll coach you, take care of all that. We offer up two free classes every day, um, either on Zoom or Facebook. So even if you're not a member of IFAS, you can go and you can use those because, look, we want to, we're always about giving something back, right? And there's people that need us way more probably um, now than they ever have in the past and they don't have the means to do it. So this way we're giving back, we're keeping everybody engaged as best we can. Um, so that's kind of how we've adapted to this. And we're assuming on May 1, we open our doors back up and it's back to business as usual, at least to some degree. So definitely a whirlwind. It's been yeah. uh, a crazy time, but I <clears throat> think we've handled it about as about as well as we could. Well, I mean, you were pretty weathered for the storm. I mean, you guys didn't exactly open during the best economic time. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> yes, you, yes. You had I, some good I always forget that. Going. Literally housing crash. Oh, yeah, let's open a gym. Perfect. Let's go. With a new kind of storyline around like a holistic model that does like we do both things. And it's right. Like... Oh, yeah. Yeah. People are like, what do you do? What? This is 2008. So think people didn't even know what semi private training was. Right. Imagine how many times I had that discussion of you do what? Well, I, I can't do his program. No, you don't do his program. Uh, we're working out together. Yes, we're. Yeah. So just imagine those conversations that I had. Good times. Uh, and well, I mean, at least thankfully you're in a spot and it's so cool that you and Bill are in a spot to where you guys can pause memberships, right? Yep. And like, that's yep. a huge thing. In order to do that, you have to have had clients to do it, yes. right? And let's be honest, you guys have a good enough culture to where your members are probably like, dude, we, we keep paying like to support you, but you're yeah. probably like, no, it's cool. We, we're taking, like, we're doing the thing. Like, right. that's the conversation you guys are having. Like, right. you know, we're doing this on purpose, but like not everybody's in that situation. Yes. And that really comes down to the ability to get clients, yes. right? And yes. coaches, they, a lot of them, let's, let's be honest. They think of that remote coaching is the way out of having to do this version of selling. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, I don't really like the sales process. I just want people to love me for my programming and, yeah. and how much I know about the squat. Yeah, and, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me too. So what do you tell, how, what kind of advice are you giving those coaches who are going online about how do I, Mike, how do I get clients? You've been doing it for so long. It's like, you just do it. Yeah. Right? And, you, and you get to sell off reputation too. <clears throat> that, true, true. But I think it comes down to you have to market, right? Like, like most people are going to say like the, the really like purists at heart. And I'm like this, right? Like, I wish, I wish you would love me for my knowledge. You know, <laughs> I've got a beautiful brain. I can help you so much, but like you have to market and sell. Mm -hmm. And that's where so many great coaches fail. You have to be able to market. You have to be able to sell. Um, so let's talk marketing real quick because there's two ways you market. And I firmly believe this either. Number one, you market with money, right? So if you're McDonald's, or you're Nike and you have money to brand and throw money around and create commercials and all that, great. I don't think anybody watching this is a, is a tied to a major brand. So you don't get to market with money, right? You get to market with time, right? So man, I would love to be throwing 10K every day at Facebook ads and Instagram ads. I don't do that. But what I can do is I can create a video every day and you know teach my, so I use my, uh, my personal, like this account, to interact with trainers and coaches, right? This is not my gym brand. So here I'm educating trainers and coaches. So you go and you look at all the videos I created. It's, hey, here's how we do this exercise better. Here's something I'm thinking about in coaching. Here's something that you can be doing during uh, the quarantine, right? So all of those pieces of content are geared towards a specific person and they got a specific message. So that's how you have to think about your marketing, right? Like you don't have tens of thousands of dollars to spend towards your marketing budget. So you got to do it with time. You know, if it's an offline business, like it sounds like super old school, but like, Hey, you got to go out and you got to meet people, right? You got to go to games. You have to meet other business owners. You have to go to business networking meetings online. You got to create content. You got to interact with people. Hey, if somebody's liking all your stuff, shoot them a DM and say, Hey man, appreciate that. Thank you so much. You create enough content and you grow a big enough following Hey, then it's time to maybe put something in the story. Like, Hey, um, I'd love to, you know, get another online client or two. If you're interested in working together, shoot me a DM. And then it's not just, Hey, let's do this right now. It's like, no, let's, let's have a conversation 
and mm -hmm. let's see if we're a good fit for each other. So the person that says, oh, I don't like selling or I don't want to have to interact face, like, look, dude, sorry, that's not how this works. Mm -hmm. Like if you are going to have to be, if you're going to be in this industry and you're going to have to sell, you have to get comfortable with that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And I think the hardest thing is a lot of coaches feel it's like impure mm -hmm. to sell. Like, oh, I'm selling my, my soul. Well, no, like you don't have a house. You don't have a car. You don't have any of these things. You can't do more con ed if you don't sell. So if you want to be the best coach possible, you have to sell to take care of yourself. And ultimately, look, it's not selling. Selling isn't a bad word if you're doing it with the other person's best interests at heart. Totally. Right? Like that's, people used to ask like, well, how do you feel about like online coaching? It's just so much different. I'm like, I have no issue with that at all. Right? Like that dude in Japan, like who knows who his like local gym would be? Who knows what his trainer there would know? At least I know, like, he's getting a well-written program. It's based on his needs, his goals. And this is in 2006. So imagine now I have zero qualms, right? Like, if I can watch you lift, if I can write your programs, if I can do all this for you, man, that's a pretty darn good setup, right? Because I know I'm going to take good care of you. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's and, and it leads so much further back into the idea that, you know, it's not talking about a specific style of training. It's been talking about delivering experience. It's been talking about yes. delivering value. Yes. And, and that's been the consistent game this entire time around like, how do we build a value proposition as to why people want to work with us? Do we feel comfortable? Like part of putting yourself out there, like the scary part about putting yourself out there is, do I really know this shit? Yeah. Right? Is like, yes. okay, like nothing worse. Like, oh, I taught a seminar and oh, there's Dr. John Rustin sitting there. Oh shit. Yeah. Like, Okay, yes. I'm gonna be really careful with how I'm talking about the squat because guess yes. what? That dude knows more than me about the squat. So, yes. you know, but like there's a comfort level to where I need him to go, yeah, I, he doesn't expect me to be him, but yes. he goes, that was a great way to deliver that. That was a really good way to deliver that message yes. to this audience. You're not trying to be me, I'm not trying to be him, right? Yeah. But knowing your content, knowing your brand, knowing your message so well to where like it's gonna get delivered in this way and owning your spot in the market. If you're the 22 yep. year old kid, Man, talk about how you're voraciously reading every freaking thing. Like, man, this core, like all I'm doing is connecting with every coach possible. I'm trying to read every blog out there, right? Like, yep. yeah, if you're a 22-year-old kid, like you don't have 20 years experience, yep. right? Absolutely. But you have the energy of a 20-year-old that, yeah. that will read everything all day, yep. every day, and then like digest that to be like, hey, yes. this is what you're delivering. Yeah. And now it turns into like when you're writing that content, you're like, well, and, and shout the guys out, right? Like, that's a big mistake a lot of coaches don't do. Yes. Like, don't fucking beat the path up that got you there, right? right? Like, honor the people like, hey, man, I learned this from Mike. I learned this from Joe. I learned this from Ben. I learned this from whoever. Yeah. And like, oh, make that a part of your story in the content. You don't Absolutely. have to have invented the fucking squat, right? Absolutely. I'm the only Asian one on the camera. I definitely invented the squat. <laughs> right like the, so i don't know what you guys are all talking about i love it right yeah. so it turns into owning where you're at but doing it with an angle of delivering value yeah right yeah. and and that is the game yeah and and so like here's one thing that that i always thought as well so when you're the 22 year old kid don't try and act like you're the 40 year old dude <laughs> right with 20 years experience and don't write to a 40 year old because you don't know you don't have that you haven't been in that position, right? But you know who you would be great for? Your 18-year-old self, yep. right? Like, hey, man, if you're 22 and you've been banging weights for five years consistently and you've got, like, the physique to show for it, like, hey, you've learned some things, right? So don't try and talk to 30 and 40-year-olds. Talk to an 18-year-old. And that's something that always stood out to me is, like, when a 23 or 24-year-old comes to me and says, I want to create content. Okay, well, then write it for you're you're here in the the continuum right mm -hmm. just write it for the person that's a step or two behind you that's all you're trying to do right like for me i've just done this longer so i can write it for a longer period of time because i've got more experience but yeah when you're a young person and you're just starting out hey write about oh this is this thing that i learned today or mm -hmm. this is what i wish i would have known when i was 18 and i was training eight days a week trying to put on muscle you know <laughs> You don't miss the synthesis gainer with like a couple, a couple raw eggs and like oh, pounded bro. down original protein all. bars. Remember original I did it protein all. bars? I did the workouts where I was like so <laughs> pumped and so sore I couldn't take my shirt off, you know, or I'd shoot a basketball and it would go like four feet. And... So I've done it all, man. 
Oh, but through that, like, okay, you come from being a fitness guy. Like, you don't come from being a content producer, marketing guy. No. How have you learned so much about this other world? And how did you spend your time learning to stay relevant in fitness and training and working with athletes to also yeah. like learning a whole other business on top of owning a business is another, another conversation. So, <laughs> so you hit the nail on the head. I, I basically went through like a five year period uh, as I was opening the gym. And as I kind of got to that point where I hired some of the gym stuff out, right? Like we had some staff and that's where I took like a five to seven year focus. And I focused on a couple of things during that time. But like one of my big pieces was just like generating content, writing better, stories, messaging, like all the things that like great copywriters like take for granted because they do it all the time. Like as trainers, we think it's literally just about the squat. Like I'm going to write the most technically correct article on the squat. And like nobody cares, right? Again, three <laughs> people read that article, you, your spouse, and your mom. But somebody writes a really entertaining article about the squat or writes like a like creates this like super funny video that teaches you how to squat and they're like literally there's your viral article or your viral video so there's like a whole nother level to it like once you have the technical knowledge then it comes down to how do i take this and make it palatable to people right how do i put it in this like pretty format Great word. that makes people want to digest it mm -hmm. and it's so important now right because i mean look we've got literally like mobile movie players in our pocket so i can listen to podcasts i can read an article i can watch a video so like if you go to the explore page on the gram and what you're doing isn't popping like nobody's looking at it mm -hmm. so like that's how you have to think about it and you have to take this if this is your your end goal right to become like a really great content creator you almost have to take that as like i'm going to become a great coach but i'm going to take this is like my second business Yep. right my second education and i'm going to get like a phd in understanding how to create great content how to you know message things how to use stories to push my agenda or my thoughts forward like there's a lot of layers to it and so that's something that i mean i took a lot of time mm -hmm. to learn how to do because i felt like for me as not just a coach but as an educator like i just think of it as this massive umbrella of, of communication mm -hmm. Like that is like one of the most important things you can do. And if you can become a great communicator, man, it doesn't matter what world you're in, right? Mm -hmm. Business, robotics, training, architecture, like somebody that can communicate their thoughts really eloquently and can get their point across in general has a chance to be very, very successful. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think the last piece I want to touch on quickly is, you know, it, it's great to sit and say, like, I want to build all this content and I have ideas of things I want to share with the world. But you and I both know that, you know, in order to have the freedom to have the thought process to go do that, you kind of have to have your training on lock. You have to have a system yep. and you have to have it like you have to know, like, oh, OK, their heels are coming up off the ground. Boom, boom, boom. Here's what here's what I'm going to fix. Right. Or here's yep. my options. And here's the next thing that's going to happen. And a lot of young coaches and coaches in general um, don't get great mentors. They, they don't get taught a system out of the gate yep. to where they at least are empowered with the baseline knowledge to take something and run with it for a little bit. Sure. Uh, and you've been in this game a long time. You've cre recently created a, a course. You've created a system for coaches to be able to follow. Tell yep. me about that, that education system that you created. Yeah. So for me, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the backstory here because when I was coming up, I never felt like until I met Bill, like I had a great mentor in our field. Um, and, and honestly, the closest thing I had to mentors were people that I read a lot of articles from on the internet. So like a Dave Tate, a Louis Simmons, an Ian King, um, some of those early guys that were writing a lot for T Nation. And so those guys were so influential for me. And then I met Bill and obviously he's been my mentor probably ever since. But what I wanted to do was create a product and, and in this case, a certification that basically taught people like, Okay, you have a cert, right? Good for you. Does that mean you're ready to go and coach people? Like, no. Like, yeah. all that says is you probably won't hurt somebody. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do was create, like, a really practical product that taught people, okay, when you're back, when you're past, like, the 3 by 10 back squat program, you know, what do you really do when you go in the gym and you put a barbell on somebody's back and they can't squat? Yeah. What are your options? Yeah. Why is that the case? What coaching cues do you use? What kind of program should you be writing? So that's why I created the Complete Coach Cert. 
Um, what I wanted to do was kind of take a deep dive into functional anatomy, mm -hmm. uh, program design, coaching, and then progressions and regressions. So I thought these are all things that I don't think are talked about enough in regards to coaching. And it's like, so sometimes we get so caught up in like, I love Cal Beats, but people are like, oh, I'm going to go do triphasic. Like, would you even know what like eccentric, yeah. isometric and concentric are? <laughs> like you're like way out here and you don't understand like these basic concepts yet. So well, that was like my two whole of them goal. suck. <laughs> yeah. So that was like my whole goal, right? It's like, okay, you've got your cert. Here's That's your foundation. Right. This is like the thing that is going to give you an even stronger foundation in like a really practical sense. And it's based on 20 years of experience, mm -hmm. right? Because man, I had the days where if you're going to squat, you don't even have to write an, anything else. It's just squat. And it's a barbell back squat because we know that. Versus now, it's like, oh, squat, man, is that a goblet squat? Is that a plate squat? Is that a zerker squat? Is that a, you know, on and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's being able to be malleable, mm -hmm. right? Because I remember like Joe Ken, our mutual friend, mm -hmm. um, he said in one of our elite athletic development seminars years ago, he just said, look, the days of, of bringing a guy, a guy or a kid in and just putting a barbell on their back and having them squat, like those days are gone. And that's from... Not only the NCAA uh, Division Strength or Division One Strength Coach of the Year, but the NFL Strength Coach of the Year, the Professional Strength Coach of the Year. So when a guy like that says something like that, it's like, look, there's credence to this. We have to be better about choosing the right exercise, giving the right coaching cue, creating the right program for the person standing in front of us. So that's why I created that because, man, I just didn't have that. I didn't have that. And and again, for me, I want to educate this next this next crop of great young trainers and coaches. And I want to play a part in their development to make sure that, man, they're just killing it in yeah. five or 10 years. And they don't have to take 20 years of screwing up like I did to get here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the game, right? Like, you know, you and I can't sit here and say what we don't like about the industry, the way it's coming up, if we're not willing to help. Yeah. Right. And Absolutely. I think that's a big thing. A lot of coaches like you, 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 you lose the right to complain the minute you aren't willing to go help. Yeah. And and that's the game we recognize that the fitness game has changed. And I get it. Like I'm in the in no man's land where I didn't have technology my entire life. My yep. parents had dial up till I was a junior in college. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, that was awesome for a 13 year old boy. Right. right. Like, oh, there's, yeah. You, you guys are on aim. I don't even know what that is. Like, yes. uh, and so like, I have this world, where, like I understand that like going to 24 hour fitness and grind. The only yeah. way you're going to get value is like, show me how many hours you can work. And yeah. that's not the message that's being told to the industry anymore. And it, like, it, it irks me a little bit because I'm very much like, a, you want to earn your spot in this industry, you will work. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I give up 40 weekends a year for the last 10 years. Like, let's play the game of who works the hours because I'll right. win. Right? right? But it's like, no, but the game, like, there is a better balance. That is what remote coaching brings into the ability to do. Yep. It does allow the opportunity to where, oh, shit, you can have a family and you don't have to be at the gym 19 hours a day. Yep. You, you know what I mean? It allows you to build and make that decision that, hey, this is an option for us. So yep. we can't demonize remote coaching. We just have to make sure that it gets better. Absolutely. And that's why we're out here doing this is what resources can we provide with the bumps and bruises and the knocks we've taken? Guys, trust us, getting a haymaker in the first round doesn't hurt as bad as the 12th round, right? Yeah. Like, oh, so go through, like learn from this and take some information. What can you do to set yourself up after uh, Corona-19, uh, COVID-19, yeah. whatever the terminology we're using. Yeah. And how can you come out of this situation in a spot to where you can make this a career of where you can provide for a family and you can do it because you love it. Because that's yeah. why people get into this job. They get into it because they fucking love this industry and they're yeah. willing to, to work shit hours and multiple jobs just to learn how to be a coach. So yeah. uh, we got guys like Mike who are willing to give their time away from their friends and family and their business to share amazing information go to his blog, go to his IG, go to the complete coach and learn from him and get better and learn how you can take coaching and make it your thing and make it your career and sustain shitty events like this. Because yeah. I'm sorry, we're all going through shit. It sucks, but <laughs> I want you to come out of it and survive. Yeah. And, and I just want to say one thing to kind of tag on that. Like, I really feel like <clears throat> this is the impetus for a big shift mm -hmm. in our industry. Like if you weren't, at least semi interested in online training before you sure as hell are now. Right. Yeah. So I think what we're going to see is if this is like, like where we were and this is where we're at now, right. With online coaching, we're going to see a dip, but we're not going back to baseline yeah. ever again. And I think the cool thing about this is 
again, we're a resourceful bunch. We're a hardworking bunch as trainers, as coaches. And I think what you're going to see is this massive shift going forward where, yeah, absolutely. I think most of us enjoy training people in person. Mm -hmm. We're, mm -hmm. you know, for the most part, I don't want to say we're all extroverted, but we're extroverted when we're on the floor. We enjoy coaching people. But I think the days of just slugging 60 plus hours a week in the gym, we're not going to see that that much anymore because, hey, man, if I can find this blend of I work with some people offline, I work with them in the gym and I got like these 15 to 20 really awesome people that I coach online remotely on my time, man, that's a pretty sweet setup and that's sustainable. And yeah. I think that's, I think it's going to ultimately make our industry a lot freaking cooler going forward. I love it, man. Where can people find more about you? Where can they learn more about uh, your content and where can they digest yep. more of the great information you're putting out there for free for coaches? Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. So the two best places, robertsontrainingsystems.com. Um, you can go there and have free content for life between articles, videos, podcasts. It's all there and there's new stuff every week. Um, if you're not on the newsletter list, definitely sign up for that because that's how you find out about all that. Um, and then if you are like really serious, understand now is probably not the best time or when you're thinking about like investing uh, maybe in your con ed, but maybe you, you, it's maybe something it you need to uh, complete coach certification.com is yeah. the best place to learn about that. Um, I won't open back up until September. So you got mm -hmm. a little time to kind of get focused and get, get motivated towards that. But I would say those two places are the best. And then obviously I'm on the gram pretty regularly. It's my favorite platform at this yep. point, just cause you can live, you can story, you got all those tools. And again, for me, especially right now, like, I just think I'm doubling down right now on other coaches and trainers, right? It's not about the money. It's like, hey, man, we got to continue to invest in ourselves during this period of time. So when this is all done, we're out of here like a rocket, right? And we're ready to go. We're better because of it. So that's where I'm at right now, man. Videos every day, just trying to make people better. Yep. And for how many years have you been putting out consistent content for the folks uh, listening? How many 19. years? 19, 19 years consistent content every day every week every month for 19 years it's a long still time. putting out you're not on a beach in bali not as much as you probably would like to be right now <laughs> i would like to be yeah <laughs> without yeah. the kids i'm sure leaving the kids yeah. at home right now is probably the option yes. uh, but listen to that guys 19 years if you really want to be coaches forever you want to do this for your career you got to look at it it's not about a piece of content that gets you permission to live on the beach it's yep. being consistent day in, day out. So, sure. Mike, thank you so much for taking some time, brother. Uh, enjoy your time with your family. I'm glad you guys are safe and well, and we Thanks, will chat man. again very soon. All right, man. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Bye.